Have you ever wondered whether the problems in the world today would exist if we had deeper connection to ourselves, others, and the environment, and acted from that place? Welcome to the Conscious Action Podcast with your hosts, Brian Burneman and Kayla Grimble, who believe that connection is the key to taking conscious action as individuals and creating a better world. We are here to raise awareness and inspire meaningful action by sharing stories, knowledge, and conversations with thought leaders and change makers. From sustainability to well-being and everything related to conscious living, our mission is to empower you to be the change that you want to see in the world. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Conscious Action Podcast. I am Brian Burneman, your host. Um, for this episode, I have the pleasure of having Derek Handley to be here with us and to share uh, his amazing journey, at least amazing, I'm adding that, uh, to, to share a little bit of his insights and his journey on what has been happening and where are we going towards in the future. So first of all, Derek, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And as I always do, I'm going to invite you, if you don't mind, to introduce yourself and let everyone know who are you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, Brian. Um, yeah, it's always an interesting question, how you approach or introduce yourself. And you never know, you know who's listening, so context is always kind of different depending on the person. But um, obviously, like everyone, I'm many different people. I'm a dad to a nice, lovely seven-year-old boy who always keeps us um, entertained and challenged. I'm a... Uh, husband. I am a recently returned you know, New Zealander back to New Zealand a couple of years ago from about almost 15 years, mostly in New York. And what brought me there was as an entrepreneur building companies straight out of university in New Zealand and trying to build a global uh, company around the world as a young person. Uh, and, you know, really I guess entrepreneurship has become, is a thread of, of my whole life and more recently kind of moved to the other side of the table as an investor. So I invest in different founders that are working on really big problems around a future of a sustainable world and creating massive opportunities in really interesting markets. I'm also still a student. I study. So I'm back at university. Uh, I'm studying religion and psychology at the moment. I also teach and you know, develop programs at University of AUT. Uh, and now, as you know, I'm also a podcast host. I host a conversation series as well called Wiser Conversations uh, that lives at the intersection of spirituality and psychology. Uh, and, you know, a lot of different things, I think. But the thing that motivates me and inspires me the most in terms of what is it that's most interesting in what makes me me is a curiosity for uh, how to live uh, the, the life that you're meant to live, how to live that in, in the best way, how to understand how it fits in, like what is it that you're here to do? Why are we all here? Um, and are you living, you know, the, the truth that, that you're here to represent? And so what I'm most interested in is helping and enabling others to ask and inquire in those areas and also express those um, facets of their lives and themselves. So in everything I do, whether it's a university or wise or as an investor or as a student, they're all strung together with the same thread. Mm, beautiful. And because I, I know, and as you say, like there's so many different facets, uh, what led you to to this path, like was there something from your childhood or your years at, at uni that took you to to have this worldview that it's quite broad, quite open, but also taking that entrepreneurial journey that it's not the easiest one? Um, I... I've always been drawn to doing things differently. So I've never been afraid to do something that looks like it's difficult or hasn't been done or isn't the way you're meant to do something or isn't the expected thing to do. 
So whatever is expected or is normal or is standard, I have always been drawn away from that. Um, and I think that, re that means by default that you are cutting your own path, you know, in a sense. And that's been there from the beginning, I guess, from adulthood. From earlier on, I think I've been obsessed earlier, particularly even as a young kind of boy, on how do you do something to the best that you can? So how do you really become great at something? How do you practice? How do you improve? How do you keep getting better? And those two things, you know, are the hallmarks of kind of like my first, I guess, 10 years as an adult going out there, trying to build things, create a new path, do something new, do something that's difficult. Um, at the same time, trying, trying to get, to get better. So where does it come from? I don't know. The entrepreneurial aspect, I think it's always come from the idea that you can create your own future. You can create something people do create things and the people that have inspired me the most are either people who've created amazing things as an entrepreneur or people that have led incredible transformations in, in culture you know so mm -hmm. political or social or civic leaders um the other part i guess is my dad and my mom were entrepreneurs in a in a, in a family-oriented way like they had a business of their own from when i was about six so we were surrounded by a flavor of creating your own destiny and, you know, being responsible for your own path. That normalized in a sense, oh, this is, this is a thing that people do. They just come up with stuff and make a business and make it happen. So I think that helped a lot. Mm, yes. And it's so interesting. I, I'm always fascinated because I, I always find that we have that part of either we grew up with something that our family showed or we discovered something. And for me, for example, I, when I was a teenager, that my parents started to get a lot into spirituality and that started to become my normal. And then I started going on my own path and and i love what you said before the fact that how to be the best version that we can be of ourselves i do believe that we are still uh all the time and i am striving to my full potential as a human being and how does that look like and how do i need to behave and live my everyday life to get to that place and i think that even just having that framework of the potential it's an incredible place allows me to see that instead of being negative especially with the times that we're living on now like we are in times of huge shifts huge challenges but as well huge opportunities mm -hmm. and and i think that the vision that individuals like you have of being able to see that there's a potential and there's opportunities how can we create that uh, i think that that's very commendable and and i would love for you to share a little bit of what have been the main um ways that in your own journey as an entrepreneur or what you've been working with ira uh, and the the different ventures that you are actually supporting what from that has been one of some of the main things that allowed you to to see that wow we are on the right direction so do you mean like what is it that validates to me like i'm on the right path or i'm doing the right thing or yeah. i feel like i'm in the, in the right space um i think uh it's interesting because early on uh, you know, especially coming straight out of school, it was very uncommon in New Zealand to try and build, you know, a technology oriented startup at the age of 21 or, or something. And so everywhere you turned, you were not getting much validation. So if you're doing something that is kind of out of the ordinary, it, you need a huge amount of self, um, self belief or self reliance that you are doing, you, you see something that other people don't see. Mm. And that takes a lot of your own conviction 
And you can inform that conviction by other things, by feeling like you're very well researched. You have very good reasons for pursuing something. It's not just an instinct. Um, and that helps you build up your the logical side of your brain as to why what you're doing is the right thing or that, that you, you should believe in it. And then the other side of the, the brain or the heart is kind of the more instinctive thing. Like in your gut, you feel that this is what you are being called to do and it motivates you. So you end it, your whole body you're, you're is energized. Your mornings are easy. Your evenings are everything about your life is easy. Even if the, even if the day is extremely difficult, right? And that's kind of when you know you're on the right path. Um, when the difficult, stuff is still uh in a sense effortless like it's still joyful to do the hard work or to go through the, the challenges um so that's always a really great you know signal at least for me it has been uh, but you still kind of get lost or go in different paths or directions and get dragged by different things that you don't recognize when you meet them until you sit down and look at them and often that comes in the form of your own sense of ego or place or what you're trying to create and getting confused between what are you creating out of a place of truth and what are you creating out of a place of ego or fear? Like what do you want other people to see? What do you want other people to perceive? Uh, what are you worried about if other people don't think this of you? And, you know, when I was, uh, younger, I had quite a phase of that, not really clear. Well, why, why am I doing this again? And, and it was getting very mixed up between what I'm meant to be doing versus what I think other people uh, are looking to me to be doing and what I want to show them. And so then you have to untangle it and realize and disconnect it. And like, what is the motivation behind this? Is it a pure motivation coming from a sense of purity? Like, if you strip it all back, would you be doing it anyway? Or is it coming from a motivation of what you're hoping that people will perceive, right? And I've come, I think I've become much better at being able to disentangle those things in recent years. And it's quite difficult because when you look at something and you realize in the past you did something because you were trying to show something or be something or uh, from a place that's not, not really where you should be coming from, it's a little bit embarrassing to look at and go, okay, that's not really how I want to be. So now my compass is more, is this true? Like if, 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 if I had the choices or if I had no choices and I was being, you know, maybe I'm here for another thousand days because I've got some illness or something, would I make different decisions? And I think that's the test, you know, mm. for me now is more like that. Would I make different decisions in terms of how I'm spending my time or how I treat people or how I behave with people? Uh, every night you go to bed and think about that. And I think that helps really put things into perspective. And, you know, the Stoics have this idea called memento mori, where it's just like present your, the idea of your own death to give you a reminder of your own mortality and fragility of life, which helps you put yourself into perspective again to just check in. Because that's really the ultimate um, uh, not measure, but it's the ultimate kind of barometer, like in the face of and in the aftermath of death, would you make different decisions? And another way people think about it is an obituary test, right? Is this the way you would want to be remembered? Um, so, you know, your question is really one that applies to everyone and my journey's changed as it's gone through but more and more now i'm trying to be at peace with okay you've really got to spend your time on things that satisfy those tests you know and it's it's not always easy to be 100 percent. you've got to have to do some stuff that you just need to do but i think the journey that we're on is to try and as much as possible live from that place yeah you know what i mean right yeah that, that's beautiful to say then and i do believe quite similarly um, in terms of being able to do the work on ourselves to then be who we really are and not as you as you were saying how others perceive us and I do know that we have this huge conditioning that is we care too much of other people's opinions and I am glad that I grew up in a family that I was taught that 
they don't matter as much as what I think of myself. Mm. Listen to people. There's wisdom in other people's point of view, perspectives, but mm. ultimately the truth and my uniqueness comes from within or from my connection or how, whatever we want to, to call it. And in that place is where I do believe that more and more we are waking up as a collective to the fact that we need to be more true to who we are and do the right things. And I do, and, and I want to use this as a segue to, to ask you about what do you see that is the place that founders have in businesses or CEOs have in businesses to actually be the, the catalyst for change in, in the world that we need to actually go towards? Mm. Well, the interesting thing about founders of any kind of thing, right, of an organization or a nonprofit or a movement or a company is that almost always they are expressing an interpretation of what they really feel they're here to bring forth in the world, which is what I love about founders and which is obviously why it aligns with all the way I, uh, the work that I do and the way I, what motivates me. So when you see someone putting it all on the line to found something, whether it's a small shop in the suburb neighborhood or Tesla, uh, or think of something like Oxfam, like someone had to start everything, right? Mm -hmm. You know that it's so hard. So when you're a founder of any sort, of any size, of any kind of operation, I think you have an appreciation that it's just so hard. And to do it takes everything. It takes your full identity, it takes your ego, your energy, your time, it takes obviously money sometimes, it takes sacrifice. So you know when someone puts it all on the line like that, that they really believe something. They really believe something powerfully enough that they are going to do this and they're going to walk through the fear and because it's also extremely frightening for a lot of people. Um, and they do it anyway. And so I think that's what's amazing about founders. They're expressing a core of who they are. Then the question is, what is that expression? And then there's a, there's, then there's a gradient. And what's most fascinating and interesting and exciting to me is those founders who have all of that because they've decided this path, but their mission or their core is around some sort of injustice in the world. And they're going to build a company to solve it, you know, like an injustice in the broader sense, like, whether it's carbon, carbon, climate change, uh, opportunity, access. Um, it's just the whole broader sustainability agenda. So when you have the power, the superpower of being a founder and you combine it with something that links into, you know, the sustainable development goals or some other issues that are important. Um, I think the mixture of those two are what will help us move forward through so many of the challenges that we've got. Mm. which obviously also are opportunities, right? And to me, we're just at the beginning of that wave, you know, we're at the beginning of that kind of long-term sustained 10, 20, 30 years wave. If you think about the internet, we're about 30 years into that. Still so much innovation and so much creativity is happening. I liken this movement of people building companies to get us more to a sustainable world is pretty much like 1996 of the internet. And there are gonna come out of them, the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Googles, the giants that reshape the world, except they're gonna be reshaping things like energy, carbon, food, maybe even education. They're gonna reshape things that currently have these monoliths, whether it's a Dow Chemicals or a Kraft Foods, these multi, multi, multi-billion dollar companies that have been built over the last 100 plus years. Our belief is that you'll see new ones of those come up, just like you've seen new types of media and internet and retail companies come up. So we have huge faith that that will help accelerate so many different things that we need. Um, it doesn't solve everything. You still need all the other components, you know, government, philanthropy, social movements. But in terms of your question about entrepreneurs, I think there's a huge role for them to play on all these issues and challenges that we, you know, those kind of founders will relish in overcoming. Mm. 
Yes, definitely. And, and I'm glad that you just mentioned something that I was going to try and, and touch on, but you just mentioned a little bit what, what is the, the place that, that we need to create that intersection of government and businesses and individuals? And is this a multi-pronged approach or is there a place that we need to start and um, and what is your view on, on all of that? And what's the place, especially, of, of businesses in, in that? Mm. Um, I think the ideal idealist world is that you have, you know, your business world and your government world and your um, whatever, non-profit movement building or geek term, civil society kind of world, if they all work together, right, to get on top of things and, and move the world forward and, or move the country or move the city forward. I think that's the ideal, the, the, the idealist version. But the more I see how things actually work and the more I experience and have been, you know, closer to things, I struggle to see how that works. You know, I think governments are motivated by totally different realities and our, I guess every government's different, but um, if you look at our government, there are decisions that a lot of people could say, these are obvious decisions. There's no, I don't think you find anyone in New Zealand who would really disagree that we could be an entirely electric uh, transport fleet within a few years, if we just decided to be. So when you see that, and you know that would be a combination of uh, non-profit and advocacy and education, if you're a combination of business in terms of new energy grids, new vehicle distribution mechanisms, partnerships with all sorts of re uh, companies that are making not only things like Teslas, but every type of vehicle is being made at the moment. Trucks, buses, lorries, every type of electric vehicle. So, it's so it seems so obvious to most people, it's virtually impossible, right? Even with the government that's supposed to be progressive. So then you have to be a realist and say, well, that doesn't, if, 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 if it doesn't get even one inch forward in the last three years, how does it get forward on that model? Mm. And therefore you then have to fall back and say, okay, at some point business is going to have to fill that gap. So I think with the different levers, sometimes it's civil society that moves things forward and then the others follow. Sometimes it's business and then they drag people through. And sometimes it's government through certain policies and that enables the conditions. But the ideal would be all three work together. Um, and that would be amazing. I just think it's much, much harder in practice than in reality. And they're so disconnected from each other. But maybe it can change. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do you think that, especially, like, I mean, this is just my view, with all of the instability and all of the changes that we are seeing now, for good and for bad, do you think that, this is a unique moment for a system change in terms of that? Uh, lots of people were talking about that, right? Three months ago, uh, or was it a bit more? Everywhere around the world, people started raising this idea of the system can change now. We also had a lot of it go on 2008, 2009. The last time round, the system was rescued and back to normal very quickly, too quickly. So it was too quickly and the world moved on and then it was, the whole opportunity was lost. If the banks were allowed to fail, the system would have needed to be redesigned, but nobody was willing to let that happen. And I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, it's just, it is what it is. I think we're in a similar situation this time around. People see the opportunity to create the change. They see the opportunity to redesign things, rethink things, but, um, First of all, as we were speaking about before this podcast, uh, this conversation, we, we in New Zealand went back to normal within basically 24 to 48 hours. You know, after three months of talking about how things could be so different and unusual, the only thing that was different after that period that really was different when you look at the macro was definitely there was a dislocation in where people worked from. I think that's true. People are not going into the office as much. But in terms of all the other ideas that everyone had and the amount of capital that the government would be able to deploy, um, 
the opportunity in a white paper, in a theory paper, in a PowerPoint, and in a conversation on a panel is 100% there. The reality, it's like nowhere. It's nowhere to be seen, right? So I, for better or worse, I don't see that being something that's happening in, 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 in New Zealand, like, okay, post COVID, will there be a whole new way of being or doing? Um, if we're gonna spend 10, 20, 30 billion, are we gonna do some things that actually change the system? Uh, doesn't seem to be convincing, with the exception of the one system that is actually suffering a near fatal blow, which is the tourism industry. So everyone who was in or around that industry understood that it was becoming unsustainable, that, that the numbers were too high volume, not enough value. Everything was being put under pressure. And I spent a few years on the sustainability panel for Air New Zealand. And you know, this was maybe three or four years ago when we started and it was already becoming clear. And so I think on that system, there may be redesign, but the reality is every single person that operates in that system, like an operator or tourism operator, is currently on life support. So the last thing they want to think about or can at the moment probably is a whole new, new world. Like they're just thinking about how to survive. Yeah. So I think that puts a lot of, so you, you have these utopias you can come up with and then you see the reality. People's livelihoods are hundred percent at stake, thousands and thousands of jobs. And if you want to go and ask them to reimagine how they might do things differently, I don't, I don't think they're going to be very kind to you. They're just going to, you know, their focus is how do I see next month? Yeah. You know, so yeah. tougher than we think maybe. Yes. And, and I do think that, and this is, has, has been for me one of the things with the last few years that I, I am an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And, and to be able to marry both and to understand like, yes, that's, I do think that we can go in that direction, but mm. we are here now yeah, and, exactly. and understanding what's, what's the next step and yeah. what's the next step for me, what's the next step for businesses, what's the next step mm. that government can take or, or social movements. And, and I do think that we are seeing globally some disruptions and some changes, but of course everything takes time. And mm. how do we do that? And, and I, for me, one of the most interesting aspects of everything is education and learning just in general and understanding how that could actually be for our future. One of the big, big keys of being able to change the way that the system is set up of education system mm. and to create and shape the kids and adults as well that will have a different view on how to approach life. Mm. Yeah, I think that um, COVID maybe gives an opportunity in the window of education. Uh, not, not, not too much because education still keeps going, right? It's not like it stops. Um, it's getting forced to do things slightly differently. Uh, but there may be other pressures on the education system to rethink what it's there for. And, you know, my whole thing about education is its first goal should be to help enable someone to understand how to design and live a good life. And what, what you know, what that means about what, you know, what is it that contributes to feeling like you're building a good life? Um, what are the components that you need to think about and holistically, how can you go about thinking your life, about your life as opposed to content and subjects and things that are skills or domain knowledge, which the reality is as you get older, you, can re you realize you can learn anything. You can go back and learn anything. So if you made a mistake learning about a certain subject when you're 18 and 25, you change your mind. It's not like it's all over. But if you haven't figured out how to design and plan and understand what your values are, how you build habits, how you can stay sane, comfortable, peaceful, like how you can manage your temperament, your mood, your energy, what, how you create goals, how you have a vision, all these kind of things on, well, how do you design a life? If you don't know how to do all those things and you're moving along and you've, you'll be, you've got a bachelor's of some subject, but you're in a job that you hate, you know, it's almost like, what's the point? So I'd like to play a role in education in terms of turning it back inwards onto the person as opposed to the lecturer and the subject 
and the degree and the path to the job, which is what's, what it's become. Mm. Um, so I think there's huge opportunity to rethink and transform all of that. And at the very higher end of education, people questioning at the moment, I'm paying 200,000 US to go to this university that is on Zoom, you know, <laughs> like uh, whatever, like a, like a Yale or something, whatever it might be. Um, that's got to make people question things too. Mm. You know? So yeah. I think it's fascinating, yeah. Yeah, and, and I do think that I, I do see a, a shift. Um, also, like, I mean, the last few years, there have been a lot of different models of education that have been testing different mm -hmm. approaches. And, and I do completely agree that if we understand ourselves, and mm. that should be our aim of life, not only exactly. of school, uh, if we understand ourselves, then that is a system that will create the world that we need. And, and to say this, I, I always have a few questions that I try to make sure that all of our guests on the podcast, um, I, I get to ask them. And my first question is, what is one resource that you would recommend to others? You mean just in general? Yeah. Book, huh. a podcast, yeah, a movie. Um, well, a podcast, obviously yours and mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there's so many different types of books. I think, um, you know, a book that I think is really fundamental and important and profound is Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning. I think it's a really great way to reset and have some distance between your life and what you think it's about and what you might want it to be about. Um, so that's like a phenomenal kind of, you know, place to go. Uh, another podcast that I really love is one called On Being by Krista Tippett. Um, it's very long and luxurious and kind of like hour long conversations with really interesting people about, you know, what does it mean to live really? And that's a very, again, moving and, and helpful um, resource that I love too. Yes, and there is so much. I always, like I find, and I know that I ask this, but there's always so many things. If, if someone would ask me this question, I would be like, oh, wow, there's this, there's that. So many different ways of approaching it. But at the end, like, in a lot of the conversations that we have, it's like, and this is going to be my next question. People ask me like, what's your one go-to tip? Like what, if you have only one tip to tell me on yeah, how to do okay. my life, what is that, it? That's easier for me to, to, to answer, which is my tip is, and I don't, I mean, I don't conf confess to always upholding it, but my life goes best when I have structured time every week, a few hours, to think about how my life is going mm. and everything. So, you know, a written journal, not online, sitting somewhere in silence, like in a library or somewhere where no one's going to disturb you and reflecting on all the moving parts. And some of those sessions might be revisiting a set of goals. Some of it might be reflecting on conversations that are going on in your head about a particular conflict or idea or thought that maybe is challenging or inspiring. It could be anything. And you start to verbalize it, write it down. Some of those conversations could be moving forward. Like, what do I dream about? What do I want to see? Um, some of them could be more practical, like, okay, what are the you know five milestones I want to achieve in the next 12 months? But the space, which is unoccupied by any, anything that isn't just reflecting on how, you're living and building your life. Um, that is the most precious and fundamental space in my life at any time. And when things start to go off the rails a little bit, it's because I know I haven't got enough of that space. Mm. And obviously people say, Oh, well, where can you come up with an hour or two hours? And the joke is the irony is how could you not? Because it is the reflection on the most important thing. It's like working in, the engine of being alive versus like looking at it from above and working on it. Like, okay, this piece doesn't look like it's going very well. Like how should I, how should I reflect on it or think about it or do it differently? So that's the most important thing that I think will um, 
give people perspective and distance on a regular, consistent basis, which you then can adjust all the other moving com components and, com and compartments that you're trying to work on, you know? Yes, definitely. And that's such a big thing that I think that everybody needs to know that there is, people are in this automatic uh, pilot mm -hmm. and on this race to yeah. nowhere, really and exactly. not giving themselves the time to actually yeah. be and this is part of the lack of education that we have right and you need to step off the treadmill purposefully it's a sacred time i used to basically have it on friday mornings and it would be nothing would get in the way of it you know, not anything like a meeting or you know it's just a block of time that is reserved only for that and that's the kind of discipline that i like to get back to um but it's super powerful yeah mm -hmm. Yes, wonderful. And just one last thing. How can people find you? Where can people go to, to listen to your wiser conversations? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a lot less out, out there on, on the internet these days, but uh, the, most, the most easiest way to connect with what I'm thinking about at the moment is wiser conversations, which is, you know, you just look it up on the podcast anywhere you do, you get podcasts. Oh, you can see it on the website, wiseconversations.org, and you can see the different ones we've had. Um, but I'm, I'm in the usual places, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm just not creating a lot of content uh, other than the podcast, um, but I'm easy to get hold of. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Derek. I know that you have a busy day ahead. So thank you so no much for your time and for being able to, to share a little bit of your story and your knowledge and wisdom with everyone. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. And thanks for creating this space. And thanks for, um, you know, holding these conversations for people. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode. If you have any comment or something that you learned from this episode, we would love to learn that. So write in the comments. And I will put the link to the Wiser Conversations as well on this episode so that you can go directly to listen to that. So we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you very much. What did you like the most about this episode? Take a moment to think about what change you can make in your life today. Share your conscious action on social media using hashtag conscious action and tagging at conscious action and said so we can celebrate your impact on the world and create a ripple effect. One easy action we would love for you to take right now is to share, like and subscribe to this podcast. This will help us get these messages out into the world and inspire more people to take conscious action in their own lives contributing to the better world we hope for.